I've been skiing. Now, this may not be a big thing to many of you, but for me, well, it's been nine years since I last stood on skis or a snowboard, and frankly, I was terrified, mostly of falling down the mountain. Uh, anyway, I shouldn't have worried. Of course, Sarah is a phenomenal skier. Always has been, always will be. Beautiful style, beautiful sense of composure and balance. Nothing phases her. Me, I'm a capable skier, uh, but on the whole, it's controlled falling as opposed to stylish skiing. Uh, but it was absolutely wonderful. Four days of intense skiing with some of the nicest people on the planet, all of whom I am incredibly proud to call my friends. To, to each and every one of those, you know who you are. Thank you for just such a fantastic weekend and for reintroducing me to the slippy stuff, at least within a decade of the last time I went. But that said, uh, my knees and my ribs actually from laughing, but my knees are still hurting a week later. And of course, as a few of you have spotted and pointed out to me, I didn't get a chance to record a podcast. So here it is. I'm Paul. And this is the Mastering Portrait Photography podcast. So there you go. I can only apologise. I was completely, completely distracted uh, by the opportunity to go for a long weekend and get a little time on the slopes, even after a decade. And it was truly amazing. It was raining when we arrived, though. Uh, but for the four days we were on the slopes, we had really beautiful, crazily warm weather. And then it started raining as we left. So all in all, a perfect week end. Uh, however, as with every everything in a small, intensive business like this one, and you'll all know what I'm talking about here, of course, it did mean having to cram a huge amount uh, in the week before and a huge amount into the week subsequent, as my old boss at Accenture uh, would have put it, you have to stick £12 of shit into a £10 bag. But I managed to do it. Uh, but the one thing that did go, and I didn't have time to record, was the podcast. So for all you podcast fans... I'm so, so sorry. Uh, also, I had to find quite a lot of extra time in the week or in the months running into the trip uh, to get to the gym as I was appallingly unprepared to spend four days chasing around the Alps with a group of really accomplished uh, skiers. And even with just a few weeks of prep, mostly cross trainers and what bikes, the quad burn, the quad burn was still horrific. Uh, however, I cannot wait to the next time we go. Uh, on the updates front then, as you might understand, not a huge amount to report. Uh, we've had some lovely shoots. Uh, we do seem to be running at full tilt already, which is a little scary. It is a little scary, as this really should be, I think, anyway, the quiet part of the year. And I still have so much DIY to do in the studio. I'm looking around and I can see shelves and things that need moving blinds that need putting up and I keep tripping over this big pile of tools that I brought down here I think I really should find the time to use them but still it's better to be busy than to be quiet I guess uh, on the mastering portraitphotography.com website uh, side of things uh, there's quite a lot of stuff going on there actually at the moment most of it's behind the scenes uh, to give you an idea of the stuff that's going on it took me a couple of days uh, to rebuild the basket uh, as you come out of the store uh, because it was malformed, malformed, misformed, malformed. Uh, I don't know who sells it. It's a WooCommerce plugin. And uh, I don't know why, but it isn't, um, or it wasn't anyway, it wasn't responsive, which is ridiculous. In this day and age, who produces a plugin that isn't responsive? Anyway, it took me a day. I've still got quite a lot to do. Uh, but we are adding lots and lots of new bits and pieces. The one big push this week uh, has been to get some content on there to help on the business side of things. Uh, so if you remember and you visit the store, you should notice there are some new room sets. Now, room sets are simply uh, images that help you and your client visualise exactly how images might look when they're put into or created as wall art. Um, so we've been building these quietly in the background. Uh, they're good for blogs and Instagram as well, but primarily they're for you to help or for us to help sell images to the client. Now, we're still developing this, but the idea is that you don't need uh, Pro Select, for instance. You just need Photoshop and some basic Photoshop skills to create ultra-realistic previews of how your client's images might look huge on a wall. And of course, if you can show how incredible they're going to look on a wall, 
you stand a really good chance of selling them. Now, they're not so useful if you just sell files, uh, but if you're like me, someone who sells wall art, these are really, really, uh, really valuable. And I'd love to hear your feedback on them. If you don't mind, it would be great if you uh, are of a mind to download a couple, download the instructions, have a look, see if you can get them to work, how it feels, the process, and then let me know so that I can tune what we're creating um, and how we're going about it. It would be really, really, really valuable. Uh, they're free at the moment to our MPP members. So if you are an MPP member, log in and there they are. If you're not an MPP member, a masteringportraitphotography.com member, why not <laughs> get across there, go and join. It's free to join. And then the downloads are free, at least for now, at some point in the future. Of course, as is the way of things, we will start charging for some or all of them. So now really is a good time to go and have a look. Uh, we will also do some for those of you who use ProSelect and other frame preview programs frame preview programs as <laughs> a mouthful uh, then we will be doing some for uh, pro select as well but just at the moment i'm rendering them up one by one by one trying to make them ultra realistic and not look like they're cgi'd uh, so that your client finds them believable and of course that should help when it comes to sales revenue uh, okay so on to the rest of our regular announcements bit uh, a couple of promotions for me really <laughs> sorry about that uh, the first is the two fellows workshop. Now I've banged on about this for ages and ages and ages. It's the 11th to the 15th of May. And where else, where else would you get access to a top portrait photographer? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is me. Uh, a top wedding photographer. Sorry, I'll redo that with the right inflection. A top wedding photographer. Uh, that'll be David Stanbury. And all in a castle in the mountains of Italy. And that's not all, of course, because with Sarah, my beautiful wife, Jane Stanbury, Dave's beautiful wife, Karen Massey, Paul Massey's beautiful... I've gone off on a thread now. Uh, Karen Massey and Martin Baines all present as well. You really, really do get access uh, to top draw information on all aspects of your photography business, from the creative to the sales, from profit and loss to planning and client relationships. Throw in the ability to ask as much as you want, chuck a portfolio review into the mix, a couple of glasses of wine, and it really is one of the best weeks you could possibly spend investing on your photography business. It's so damn good, I would go. Well, I would go if I wasn't already going anyway. Uh, so hop across to thetwofellows.co.uk, thetwofellows.co.uk for details. Uh, or just search for The Two Fellows and you will find us. And as a footnote to this, actually, uh, this note goes out to the really nice chap who I've just come off the phone to. So as I was putting this podcast together, someone rang into the office to ask if he could attend The Two Fellows workshop. It is truly a funny old world. And it was actually him who was protesting that I hadn't produced a podcast for a while as well. So <laughs> here you go. Here's the podcast that I was producing before being interrupted uh, to talk to you about uh, the Two Fellows Workshop. And I really, really, really look forward to seeing you there in Italy. Uh, right. But still on the topic of workshops, another another shameless self-promotion, ladies and gentlemen. If you can't justify a whole week in May, why not just come for a single day workshop? We are running and have, this is the second time we've done this, myself and Sarah are running a cheeky, cheeky little one day workshop for those just starting out with their photography skills down at the glorious Watley Manor. Now this is part workshop and part lunch really so we're spending a day going through reading the light constructing the shots it's family for family portraiture in this particular instance uh, a little bit of photoshop a little bit of lightroom a little bit of lunch a little bit of wine and it's all for just 95 pounds for the whole day and uh, the website says it includes a gusborne sparkling wine reception with canapé and a two-course lunch with a glass of wine coffee and treats <laughs> I tell you what, though, the wine, the, the lunch, the coffee and the treats are all delicious. And of course, lunch means we get to sit around talking about photography as well as eating. 
Uh, we ran this last year down at Watley. Um, they asked us to run it, and it was brilliant fun, very successful, and the lunch was amazing. It has a Michelin star, this place. It's fantastic. And so if you fancy that, it's on the 11th of March and starts at 10 a.m. in the morning. The registration, I think, is at 9 Again, you have access to myself and Sarah for the whole day, so feel free to bring those tricky questions with you, and we'll see if we can answer them. It is just 95 quid, which seems to me to be a bit of a bargain. It would be 95 quid just for the lunch alone, Uh, but we get to spend the day uh, chasing around, creating beautiful images at the same time in this stunning venue. All you need to do to book is to head over to Watley Manor, head over to their website, or just search for Watley Manor Paul Wilkinson and you will find us. And you'll also see while you're on there just what a stunning, stunning hotel this is. It's glorious. Uh, If you fancy it, myself and Sarah will be staying the night before as well. Uh, So we might see a few of you in the bar. Uh, Okay, that is absolutely enough of the self-promotion. Let's get on with this week's podcast. Now, this week's podcast is an interview with one of my favourite people in the industry, a photographer whose work I've loved for years, really. Um, His name... For years, really, he's a trainer, a photographer, an ex-policeman, I don't hold that against him necessarily, a judge, a dude, and an all-round nice guy. And of course, that is the absolutely fantastic man, Gary Hill. Uh, He's also from Lancashire, Lancashire, which just adds to his northern niceness. Now, this interview was held in the bar. (laughs) It was held in the bar at the end of the first day of judging for the SWPP convention. Myself and Gary were sitting on the same panel, and with maybe a little hindsight, the bar may not have been the best place to record a podcast from an audio point of view, but it made us both very happy to be sat there with a pint, chatting away right in the middle of it all. And maybe that's just my fear of missing out, uh, but I didn't want to disappear to a far corner. So in the end, I hoped you'd understand and would forgive the appalling background noise. And given we'd just come out of a particularly intense judging session, I thought I'd start the podcast interview by asking Gary why he gets involved with competitions and being a judge. That's a really good question. The, the main thing for me was when I, when I started getting involved in qualifications and pursuing my own qualifications and entering competitions, the biggest game for me was sitting and listening to the judging it's like having a masterclass on every single image that comes up. The good points, the bad points. And you start to see errors in your own work. Um, then when pursuing my fellowship, um, I attended a judging school because I wanted to know more. It piqued my interest. And you're always learning in this game. It doesn't matter. And it's not always about picking up the camera and learning. It's sometimes about the things that you can't learn with the camera in your hand. And the best way is to try the alternate. So going to judging school, getting involved, becoming qualified as a judge. And now, you know, I think it's important that we give something back because standards are slipping. The average standard is lower than it was probably 20 years ago. You know, when I grew up in my town, there was two photographers and they did everything, they were general purpose and they could do everything. Whereas now the average, I don't want to say average, but there's so many photographers that are staying at that average level and I think there's you know people like ourselves and the other judges and, and people that are pursuing qualifications. We actually owe it to the industry to give back and keep that standard high. So judging's a great way of doing that. What was a highlight from being on that judging panel? The highlight was actually this is ten years it's taken me to get to this to you know, I've judged in Ireland twice, I've judged elsewhere, but To me, the SWPP is my organisation that I've been involved with the most. I did my fellowship with them, you know. And to sit on that panel today with, you know, Rocco Ancora, yourself, Paulina Dutchman, you know, Jocelyn Conway, all those kind of, you know, and the whole judging team that we had, Imelda and, and Tony Hewitt as a chair. You know, the people you respect and you admire in the industry. And just sitting there, you have that little moment of realisation where you actually think, oh my goodness, I've actually, I perhaps do know what I'm talking about. You know, being there and giving it back to the audience is just so important. I wouldn't be sat here in a nice hotel, working, yeah, we're working and all that, but meeting the people that I've met through this industry and the suppliers and the other photographers and people like yourself that you all learn from, we couldn't do this if people didn't do what we're doing today. And, you know, it is nice to give back, you know, and... 
you see people in the audience and you're talking to them when you're not judging and they're like, oh, I'm not entering a print. I say, well, come on. And they're like, maybe next year we will. And do you know what? That makes me happy. Because as long as we keep producing these prints, then the industry is going to keep going. Now, one of the things about the SWPP judging as well as the MPA judging and the WPPI judging and many around the world is these days it's public. You can come and you can watch and you can listen. And, of course, with the two of us who are judges and have attended judging sessions, we're big fans of that because, for a million reasons, it's a useful exercise. So I thought I would ask him, why does he think it's a great idea for us as photographers to go to conferences and conventions and competitions and listen to the comments that judges make about the different images. You pay all this money on equipment, you pay all this money on training, cement that knowledge by coming and seeing the judging because you learn from every print. There's been a real push this year to give a comment on every single image. There's been some great challenges, there's been some amusing challenges, but do you know what? What you get to learn is the passion that we have to give back to that. And, and you learn so much. You learn more than you will learn from any workshop. You genuinely do. But you've got to give up your time. And we know time's money and all that. But do you know what? It's an investment in yourself. Now, one of the things that it's useful to know about judging is that, firstly, as judges, we're encouraged to enter the competitions. And, of course, to make that possible... Every image that we judge is anonymised, it's anonymous, there is no way of us knowing whose images are which, and the chairs of each of the rooms know if a print is coming up from one of the judges in the room, and so the judges are arranged in such a way that there's no danger that they're going to end up sitting on a panel when their image comes up, or at least as far as is humanly possible. There are also always two spare judges in each room, should something like that happen or maybe an image comes up that you're the mentor for that particular photographer or had a creative input and so you can immediately step aside and somebody else can judge that image for you and on top of that there's a thing called a challenge now a challenge is essentially when there is either one particular judge thinks that image has not scored well enough or badly enough to be honest it can go either way it can go down but usually scores go up and he thinks that image hasn't been understood usually or he or she thinks that image hasn't been understood and could do with more marks and he can raise a challenge also there's an automatic challenge which is when the disparity between the judges scores is so wide that under the rules of that particular competition an automatic challenge is raised the reason i'm telling you this is because During this judging session that myself and Gary had just been involved in, one of Gary's beautiful images actually came up. Now, I didn't know it was Gary's image. Gary, as it happens, the the planning had worked and he wasn't sitting on the panel. But his image was judged and then a challenge was raised. And so, as a curiosity, I thought I'd just ask him what it felt like for his image to be judged and then to sit in during the challenge process when one of the judges thought that image hadn't scored as highly as it could have. And the reason I'm asking him this is because I think a lot of us, when we first start out, don't like the idea of of our images being judged and certainly don't like the idea of listening to the feedback. So this is what it's like when you are already a judge and you hear other judges assessing your image yeah that's a that's a really good point it came up it was judged quite highly by yourself and Stuart a little bit lower by three other judges who didn't really get that it, you know there's portrait commission there's portrait creative it wasn't a commission portrait so it had to go into creative but it was a very classical black and white portrait so when that comes up and you, you see the first mark going as it was 83 84 as a merit You think, okay, but actually, maybe it deserves better than that. And then when Stuart challenged, and then you hear the points, and you sat there, and you want to interject. But the fact is, don't put the image in if you don't want to hear what's said about it. And and I learned that maybe choose a different category. There wasn't one that fit it any better, to be fair. But just makes you think, perhaps that wasn't an image to enter here. 
and I think that's a learning curve is you know it's an image that under another competition which had a more classical category or in the monthlies or something like that it would have scored even higher because there was lots of good points it was the fact it wasn't creative it was just classical and beautiful that marked it down well I found that really frustrating actually that somebody said I'm not going to say who said it but somebody said this is not creative well actually taking a simple portrait of someone who's going to engage with the camera and is beautifully lit I mean beautifully lit in, in, you've taken off all of those layers of post-production there's none there's just a face light and a print yeah it's interesting because I hear the same things you say and, and the argue, other challenges that came up about well okay that subject isn't as well engaged but look at the post-production and look at that and you know, I'm very old school in the way I shoot. I want it right out of my camera. I don't want to spend hours at the computer. I have other things to do. And um, it's interesting seeing how certain people reward different elements. And do you know what? There's no right and wrong. There's no right and wrong. Now, each of us gets to become a photographer through a completely different set of circumstances, a different route, different backgrounds, different talents, different impetus to do this. But... Having, I've known Gary for a while, and I thought I'd ask him, because I think it's interesting, although even I didn't know all of this story, I'd ask him, how did he first become a photographer? Oh, now that is a really interesting question. Um, I spent, uh, previous to this, I was in the police service. I spent a lot of time doing covert stuff within the police service, and I can't tell you a lot more than that, but we sometimes ran premises and it was the birth of my daughter I got interested in photography and I got a DSLR and then I was learning and then an opportunity came where we needed to rent some premises for a certain thing and I actually ran it as a photography studio yeah as a covert it was an overt studio but it was covertly run by the police it was very much a fashion and glamour studio you ran as a cover a fashion and glamour studio. Yep, that's true. For two years, two actually. How successful was it? Uh, we did all right out of it. Yeah. What happens to the profit? We didn't make any. We had to balance it, so it became there was zero profit. But if it, we had made a profit, it would have gone back into the the funds. Everything was accounted for by the penny. But the two operations that we ran with them were very successful. So you were there for two years. What happened at the end of two years? A lot of people got arrested for a lot of bad things. But how did you feel about shutting down your successful studio? Yeah, it was interesting. It was never a full. T- it was never a job. It was just something that we did. So it was easy to detach yourself. But what it did give me was a great opportunity to work with people. You know, and I, I'm going to I'm going to come back to this in a minute. But do you know what lacks? Well, I do a lot of training and teaching of lighting and things like yourself. I can tell within an hour whether somebody's going to be a portrait photographer. How? The way they interact with people. Because you can teach technicals in in a couple of days. What you can't teach, and and it's an argument that came up today is, you know, that somebody had said, you know, these are just normal members of the public, and sometimes you can't get that engagement. Well, BS to that, as far as I'm concerned, because you can get that engagement if you know how to work people. You know, I, I worked for 17 years within the police service, dealing with everybody from road sweepers to parliamentary officials to royalty. You know, I did some close protection work up at uh, certain members of the royal family's residences and things like that. So it teaches you that everybody is just a person at the end of the day. And people skills are, are the hardest thing to learn if you haven't got it naturally. You know, I'm naturally an introvert, but when I pick my camera up, I'm the exact opposite. And, and that's the thing. You can engage with people however makes you comfortable and makes them comfortable. Forget the technicals, you can learn that in a few days as long as you put the effort in to practice it. But I'll tell you a portrait photographer within an hour of meeting them by the, how they interact with people. What's your favourite bit of being a photographer? Making people smile. Do you know what? I, I, had, a, I had a viewing this week and... and sold some pictures which is the job at the end of the day 
but the best thing was was listening to this lady come and a session was a couple of months ago now it was extra print she was ordering and she went you know as a family we've been to four different photography studios but it's the first time my husband has enjoyed being in front of the camera he says because you made it fun and you didn't make it hard work and do you know what that's what we should be doing oh no I, absolutely I agree because um, my view has always been that the you don't there are lots of facets to photography and in the sphere in which you and I predominantly work you don't sell an image you sell a memory wrapped up in an image so you have to create the memory first and then wrap it with some beautiful pictures and if you don't do that you've got nothing to sell except paper and ink and that's not quite so powerful it's great if you're a fashion photographer or if you're an illustrative photographer but you like me would say yeah now you're a big fan of print why I'll tell you a little story again I like stories but this is true I wasn't as big a fan of print as I am now a few years ago but my house got flooded two and a half years ago in the big floods up north and we lost basically the whole downstairs and the one thing that we walked away with because we picked them up straight away was the photo albums you know I lost my father when I was 17. I lost my mother last year. I have one picture of those two people together. You know, I have, I have a digital copy on my phone, but I have two actual prints. I don't have the negative, and it's out of focus, and it's not a great image. It's a snapshot from a 35mm camera, but it's the most important thing that I own to give me those memories. How do you feel every time you look at those prints? It's just emotion. Some days it's mixed them up. You know, some days I'm happy that I've got that picture. A lot of days I'm sad. You know, we discussed the print today and emotions and grief and all of that. And But you know what? Without that, all I have is the memories in my head. So it's priceless. And, and that's, the, that's what I get to people. When, when I'm photographing families and say they've booked a children's session and I pretty much insist that there's always a family picture in there. And, and mum will be, well, you know, oh, my hair's not right, my makeup's not right, I've not, not lost weight and all of that. And I stop them at that point and I say, do you know what? In 50 years' time, your children won't care because it's about making that memory for them as much as it is for the moment. And that's what counts. That's why print, you know, we've all got images we can't get back because they're on digital media that we have either gone wrong or we don't exist anymore. So print, print lasts forever. And you're an ambassador for Digital Lab? Yes, yeah, I work very close with Digital Lab on frame wall art and printing processes on that. I also work with Graphy on album and, and things like that and, and, and other trade partners. And we all sing the same thing because we're a digital age nowadays, but, but it's moving so quickly. Let's not lose print because that's what counts. You can't look at your... USB, you can't, you can't look at your USB drive and go, oh wow, I've got some great memories on there. But you open that little photo album and it's always there. And that's what matters. Now at the time we recorded this interview, myself and Gary, we were about midway through the judging, I think, at the convention. And so I thought it'd be an idea to ask him what he was looking forward to most about the subsequent day, the day when really we get the numbers right down to the finalists and ultimately to the winner of the overall competition. I want to see a resurgence of getting it right in camera. I want to see a resurgence of photographers being photographers. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Photoshop. There's things that I've seen today that I haven't got a clue how they were produced in Photoshop, but I love the fact that they were. But do you know what? We don't want to get overtaken by digital artists and get and lose the art of photography because it isn't going to be long without till artificial intelligence comes in and it can just scan you and create a drawing from it that people can enhance in Photoshop. That makes us redundant, you know. But when you do that, you lose that tactility, that that conversation, all the things that are outside the scope of the finished print but then what make that experience and you know people buy experiences more than they buy products what we want them to do is buy the product because of the experience and I'm looking forward to being inspired again tomorrow 
Yeah, I'd agree with you. I think today has been... I mean, me and you have giggled pretty much all day. <laughs> it's been a good day. Uh, I, yeah, I just want to pick up on something you just said, and I'm just going to re-emphasise it to make sure it's crystal clear, which is that the great thing... So this is a pitch not to punters but to photographers, is to remember that... the memory the experience is immune to photoshop you don't need photoshop you might need to do a little bit of cleanup and a little bit of correction we all do that but if a memory is photoshop proof and so if you get it right in camera reason me well and give a great experience of course you don't need to do an awful lot of post-production and it means you can spend a lot more time talking to your client and a lot less time on your own in a dark room listening to podcasts like this one yeah yeah and, and actually do you know what Having done a lot of mentoring, a lot of training of other photographers, a lot of, a lot, mostly children and newborn photographers and family photographers, they're losing their lives to Photoshop. You know, I love the fact, you know, when I'm at my studio, I can do a shoot in the morning, I'll stay there, have some lunch, I'll edit in the afternoon, I get home to pick my boy up from school, and I forget about it that night. I wait till the viewing session, they come back in and they'll do their ordering, and then I've got some work to do. But it's all contained within that studio side. And I can actually still have a life. You know, which for a lot of years, when I, I wasn't as good in camera, I didn't have my focus on being as good in camera. I didn't have. You know, I don't want the 2 a.m. editing. I want to sleep. I'm getting old. Well, Gary Hill, I could not agree with you more. Uh, this, this year, my ambition is to get to bed before midnight every night rather than those 2 a.m. starts, though it's not because I'm photoshopping necessarily. It just seems to be a huge amount to do in this little business of ours. Well, what an absolute pleasure. I really hope that you enjoyed that interview and the sounds of laughter, um, the bass <laughs> from the music, the sound of tinking glasses wasn't too much of a distraction. All it did for me is make me want to go out and have a glass of wine as it happens. Uh, but like I said, I really do hope you enjoyed that interview. On the topic of interviews, uh, and also on the topic of the two fellows that I mentioned at the beginning, if you fancy having a listen to an interview between uh, myself and David Stanbury and a fantastic guy, fantastic photographer, Ross Grieve, uh, who has a, a great podcast called Talking Shot. That's Talking Shot. If you just search for that, you will find it. Myself and Dave both feature on a podcast that was also recorded in the bar. <laughs> there's, a, there's a theme. Uh, you go to a convention as a judge, you spend a lot of time socialising, it seems. Anyway, myself and Dave are interviewed talking about what will be uh, included during our one-week extravaganza uh, this year in Italy. So if you fancy that, search for Ross Grieve, that's G-R-I-E-V-E, -E, uh, and the Talking Shot podcast, and you will find that interview it's a lot of fun uh, i really hope you've enjoyed the podcast as usual my normal wrap up uh, head across to masteringportraitphotography.com for a ton of resources uh, it's the natural home of this particular podcast you can subscribe to this podcast pretty much anywhere that you could listen to a podcast so whichever is your app of choice hit that subscribe button and then each and every time we publish an episode you'll get an annoying message that says uh, there's a new one to listen to uh, if you have any questions at all, why not drop us a line? I can be reached at paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. That's paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. And remember, whatever else is going on in your lives right now, and for those of you who are affected by the coronavirus, uh, our thoughts are with you. Uh, really do remember, be kind to yourself. Take care. <laughs>